Hey everyone, it's Josh, and for this week's Select, I've chosen our 2016 episode on pterosaurs. Not flying dinosaurs, pterosaurs. They were their own thing. And this episode brings out the inner child paleontologist in me. I hope it does for you too. There's only one way to find out. Sit back, relax, and enjoy the episode. Welcome to Stuff You Should Know, a production of iHeartRadio. Hey, and welcome to the podcast. I'm Josh Clark. There's Charles W. Chuck Bryant. It's just the two of us batching it today. <laughs> yeah. That's what my dad used to say if he had to take care of me while my mom was working. We're just batching it. Is that what, was that what he said? Yeah. I thought that was a relatively new term. No. I mean, at least the, the early 80s. All right. Maybe my dad was like way ahead of his time. Why hasn't there been a movie called Batching It? I, I don't know. That That's seems actually pretty obvious. <laughs> the fact that it was around as a word in the 80s makes me even more surprised that there's not a movie called Batch in it. Yeah. That like the, the protagonist has to put on like a car wash to save their business or something like that. Yeah. Owen Wilson. What did he do? Well, he would just be the star of Batch in it, I imagine, right? I guess so. Could that guy be any more charming than he is? He's pretty charming. Speaking of charming, Chuck. Let me introduce you to a wonderful little beast named Quetzalcoatlus Northropi. Mm-hmm. Are you are you familiar? Sure. So Quetzalcoatlus is named after the Aztec flying serpent god Quetzalcoatl. Yes. Right. So it makes sense. But this guy was a real thing. Not to put down the Aztecs' beliefs or anything like that, but this is a verifiable beast at one point, uh, particularly in the late Cretaceous period. And it's what you would probably call a pterodactyl. But if you call it a pterodactyl, you'd be dead wrong, pal. Yeah. What it really is is a pterosaur. And there's a lot of misunderstandings that we're going to sort through. But the most important point is that this beast right here is 20 feet tall, as tall as a giraffe. Man. And it had a wingspan akin to about an F-16 fighter jet. And it was a bad mamma jamma. <laughs> How's that for a lead-in? That's good. I like it. I didn't even use the Wayback Machine. Just trim the fat. Gone. Oh, you do, you don't even need that old clunky thing anymore? I We just use our imaginations. We're not actually in the Cretaceous period like we would be if we had used the Wayback Machine. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, these terra or it starts with a P, of course, a silent P. Mm-hmm. Um, that is from Greek, meaning winged lizards, and that's pretty on point because they were reptiles. They were not dinosaurs. Yes, big, big distinction here. They're close. It's like a sister to a dinosaur, perhaps. They're from the same clade, which is archosaurs, but it's a really wide clade, and all that means is that they have in the very remote past some single common ancestor with dinosaurs. Yeah, and they were they were around roughly the same time period. Oh, and, definitely. And went away this, in the same fashion. Mm-hmm. So it's, it's normal, I think, for people to say, look at that pterodactyl, look at that flying dinosaur, even though neither one of those is necessarily correct. Yeah. So just to get this across one more time, pterosaurs were not flying dinosaurs. They were flying reptiles, mm-hmm. but they weren't dinosaurs. They weren't birds either. And to confuse things even further, there were birds around at the time of the dinosaurs and the time of the pterosaurs. And to confuse things even further, there were such things as actual flying dinosaurs. We call them velociraptors. Right. And these vertebrates actually were were flying long before birds and bats by, like, yeah. millions and millions of years. Yeah, I think this How Stuff Works article, this is a good one. I got to give big ups to Clint um, Pumphrey. Yeah, pretty good. The Pumph. So, yeah, he sounds like an action <laughs> How Stuff Works writer. Yeah. Clint Pumphrey. Chest beef rock. You know? Uh-huh. Um but he he said I think eighty million years difference eighty million years before yeah I mean that's birds that's a lot of years it is um, so there's a lot of like confusing stuff flying around and I think there's one other thing we should probably address right out of the gate is that you you 
you shouldn't call them pterodactyls, even though a lot of people do. Uh, pterodactyls are actually a specific genus of pterosaurs. Um, so to call all pterosaurs pterodactyls would be incorrect, but you could call all pterodactyls pterosaurs. Okay? Yeah, and and technically, like, if you have seen this this thing in movies a lot that they say, that's a pterodactyl, mm-hmm. what you've probably been looking at this whole time is one of the, the species, and they're, you know, potentially up to 200 of these species. Uh, right now, I think they've identified about 100, 130-ish. But a terra, uh, <laughs> terra nodone, is that how you'd say it? I, I Pteranodon? Re- that's what I would have gone with. <laughs> I like Terra Nodon. Right. That's probably what you've been seeing in movies all this time that you've been saying that's a pterodactyl. Like if you if you look up an image search of the uh, Pteranodon, you'll say that that's a pterodactyl because I saw it in King Kong. Yeah, it's like this giant winged beast with kind of short stubby legs and a huge wingspan and like a weird crest on its head and a long pointy beak. A pterodactyl. Everybody knows what a pterodactyl is. Don't be an idiot. Yeah, you saw it in King Kong in 1933. Saw the same thing in Jurassic Park 3 in 2001, right? Things hadn't changed all that much. But in that time span, it's actually kind of surprising because our understanding of um, pterosaurs had increased dramatically, and yet we were still just basically thinking of them exclusively as pterodactyls, which isn't the case. Yeah, there was a paleontologist named O.C. Marsh, who, uh, it's a pretty good name for a paleontologist. Sure. Uh, he collected these first fossils in uh, what is now and was then Western Kansas in the late 1800s, like 1870. And they've been, well, I was about to say they've been digging up lots of these since then. They sort of have, but uh, not nearly as many as other types of fossils because these fossils are really highly breakable and dissolvable, and uh, they're, they're tough to get a hold of and keep in one piece throughout the process. Yeah, we should, we should talk about that. Like, one of the reasons there is so little understanding of pterosaurs is because they don't fossilize very well. Nah. Because their bones were not designed to be fossilized, they were designed to allow these giant reptiles to fly. Yeah, they didn't say, like, oh, we need to be designed to leave our mark later. No. They're just like, we want to fly. Right, exactly. So early on, I think the first pterodon or the first pterosaur um, specimen was found in the late 18th century in Germany. Um, And by the time O.C. Marsh was digging them up 100 years later in Kansas, um, they'd they'd been discovered, but they'd also just kind of been abandoned because there were very few follow-up fossils that were identified, right? Yeah. So when O.C. Marsh started to dig them up, this was a, a big deal. And because he was finding virtually all of the same species, the uh, Pteranodon, um, that became the common conception of the, um, the, the, what the pterosaur is. But it was coupled with an earlier name, Pterodactyl, that had been given to the, the um, entire uh, species or the entire group Um, by Georges Cuvier in, I think, 1812. Yeah, and that first fossil you were talking about, no one knows, no one got credit for that, for digging that thing up. But like you said, it was in Germany in in limestone, like 150 million-year-old limestone, late in the 18th century. That eventually found its way to a a man with a great name, Mm -hmm. uh, Cosimo Alessandro Collini. That's a great one. Man, when I first came across this in this article, I was like, I'm looking forward to hearing Chuck say that guy's name. That's him. He was Italian, uh, mm-hmm. go figure, and he was a natural scientist. And he, like many others to follow for a long time, didn't really know what it was. Since since he uh, they found that uh, in an ancient lagoon with all kinds of seafaring creatures, he understandably thought it was a seafaring creature. Yeah. And some of the best preserved fossils that we have of these things are found in things like lagoons where something happened to them. They died suddenly, quickly, fell into yeah. a uh, like a body of water, um, which probably broke their fall a little bit. They landed at the muck and were covered up, potentially in some anaerobic, um, in an anaerobic state. And, and eventually became fossilized very gently. That's what it takes to, to fossilize a, a pterosaur. Yeah, and uh, Cuvier, who um, 
kind of got it all wrong by calling it a pterodactyl uh, for everyone in the future. He was actually the same dude, though, who did say, actually, I think those are wings, not paddles. Right. And that was, you know, a big breakthrough. Yeah, and the reason he called them pterodactyls, it means uh, wing finger in the Greek. <laughs> Right? So pterosaur means winged lizard, and pterodactyl means winged finger because, as we'll see, the the front edge of the wing, the leading edge of the wing, is actually an extraordinarily long pinky. Yeah, that's a good way to put it. I think so, too. That's a good way to lead up to a break, too, don't you think? Agreed. Let's go. Oh, the stuff we learn from Josh and Chuck. Stuff you should. Well, now, when you're on the road, driving in your truck, why not learn a thing or two from Josh and Chuck? It's Stuff You Should Know. Stuff You Should Know. All right. Okay, we're back. I feel like we kind of jumbled things up like a bunch of uh, pterosaur bones. Sure. So let's reset here, shall we? Should we reset with the, the head? Let's. <laughs> the head crests. If you've seen a movie like Jurassic Park mm-hmm. and you saw what you thought was a pterodactyl and that and he had that beautiful looking he or she, well, maybe, maybe he because now they think that maybe only the males yeah. had these head crests. Mm-hmm. Uh, these things were sort of one of the staples of, of many if not all of these species, but they were all really different and some fantastic looking and they're not exactly sure – there's still a lot of debate over what they use these big crests for. Yeah, they thought maybe they use them as a rudder in the air to steer with as makes they're sense. flying around. It does make sense. Um, some people thought that they maybe used them as a marine rudder. Maybe they used them for defense because they were like made of horn and bone yeah. covered with skin. And they think possibly they had coloring to them. Maybe they had feathers or light fur. They're not quite sure. But because there's just such a lack of understanding and because uh, pterosaur fossils are so few and far between, it's still basically anybody's guess what they were used for. But then I think in Germany, and I'm not exactly certain when this was discovered, but a, a female pterosaur was discovered. Um, a and it had a, or I should say, she had an egg in her um, oviduct still. Mm-hmm. So it was the only pterosaur to ever be positively identified by sex um, in the history of the world. And she lacked that head crest. So it really lent support to the idea that it was males only, kind of like how a peacock has the very bright feathers and the peahen does not. They think that maybe it's the same thing or more uh, akin to like antlers in deer or moose. The males are the ones that have the antlers and they think they use it maybe a little bit for defense, but mostly to say, hey, I'm a dude and I'm looking for some action. Check out the sides of my antlers. They think it was probably the same with pterosaurs now. Yeah, and th- these things, like, uh, it's amazing when you look up these pictures. Some of them are just really fantastically colored. Some of them are really big, like that uh, Tapahara Imperator. Yeah, if you look up one pterosaur during this episode, make it this guy. Yeah, this is cool. This thing looks like it literally has a sailboat sail on top of its head. It's, and, and, like, if the coloring is anywhere remotely like what the artist's conceptions are, it, it just must have been something to see. Yeah, that Nyctosaurus is pretty interesting, too. Um, this this one didn't seem to have any sort of a—it looked like a sail uh, uh, without the sail. Like, <laughs> what do you call the frame of the sail? I'm sure um, there's some great name for it. The— uh, the timber, the timber. Sure. <laughs> but these, I mean, it's they, they liken it in this article, uh, the pump does, to television antennae. And they are really big and look only clunky to me. Yeah. I, I, I mean, it'd be good for skewering, I guess, but it could also be terrible for skewering. Like if you were hunting or spearing fish with it. You could probably catch a lot of fish, but you couldn't get the fish off because it's they're just these antennae were just way too tall and long. Yeah, and then this pterodustro is really um, you should look that one up too. It's pretty amazing. This one looks like it. Uh, this one looks like if a dinosaur mated with a pelican mm-hmm. and a toothbrush. Yeah, I saw one person described it as a toothbrush with wings. 
Yeah, the, like the lower jaw has like a thousand really long, small needle-like teeth, uh, and it looks like this big toothbrushy underbite. Yeah, and it does, like when you look at it, you're like, oh, it's clearly got to be related to a pelican. Again, it's not. A pelican's a bird, and birds were around during the time of dinosaurs. And if birds are anything, they're actually the real flying dinosaurs. But it does look a lot like it. And it it makes sense that it would because from what we're learning about pterosaurs now these days is that a lot of them were ocean going, that they had the goods to fly across an entire ocean over the course of a few days, like maybe an albatross would, um, and that they would fly low, some of them, and skim the surface of these ancient oceans in uh, on Earth and scoop up marine life with their, with their jaws, with their lower jaw, just like a pelican would. Um, so, What's what's even more interesting about that, besides the idea that this is going on 100 million years ago, is that pelicans are not related to these things. So that this this trait, this behavior, this characteristic evolved more than one time. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. I find that fascinating. Rather than saying, oh, pelicans descended from that, actually they didn't. That's just two different branches of the same tree developing into something very similar. Evolution and, and isolation, isn't that what they call that? Um, yeah, or no, no? Conver- convergent evolution. Oh, okay. I think, yes, it is. It's convergent evolution. When like a trait or a behavior or characteristic develops separately among different branches of the tree rather than developing once and then descendants all have that same trait. Yeah, and although they did certainly love a good seafood meal, uh, they used to think that was sort of all they ate, mm-hmm. and now new research suggests that they do eat or did eat uh, all kinds of things, even tiny dinosaurs. Yeah, the way that they're, they describe them now is that it's just like birds, right? You've got birds that eat all sorts of different things, that fill all sorts of different ecological niches. That's what they're coming to, to the conclusion about with pterosaurs, which, I mean, Chuck, this is like a huge sea change from what it was even— back in the 1950s or 60s or 70s. Oh, yeah. And we thought there were just a few species, and it turns out there were a ton of different ones and a lot of variety and a lot of diversity. And now we're starting to kind of get a handle on that. Yeah, and they, they think they were probably able, after they hatched, to fly pretty quickly, uh, to take care of themselves pretty quickly. Mm-hmm. Um, and like you mentioned, their flying, they believe now, was they, they were kind of built for the long haul um, did weren't super fast, but could you know like a long distance jetliner, right? And but some of them there were small. Some of them were small as songbirds, and I imagine they were flitty. Yeah, I can't remember the name of one, but there was one that was extremely tiny, a very tiny little little flying pterosaur. Could you imagine anything more frightening than a what you would call a pterodactyl the size of a robin? <laughs> yeah, I <laughs> or mean, imagine a that- hundred of those. Or it could look kind of cool, like the little UFOs and batteries not included. Remember those? I didn't see that movie. Do you remember, like, the ads or anything from it, though? No. It was basically Cocoon, but set in a tenement and um, and with UFOs rather than the actual aliens. Okay. It was very similar, though. Uh-huh. I think Don Amici was in both, maybe. Oh, why not? He, hey, had that, he had that market cornered. If you can get your hands on Don Amici, <laughs> you put him in your movie, buddy. Yeah, for sure. So, okay. Where are we at, Chuck? Well, I think we can go, we can hop over to um, the fact that for many years people thought, we've already mentioned birds, but bats was the other thing mm-hmm. that people confused them with. Uh, there was a an anatomy professor named Samuel Thomas von Summering and in the 1800s, he incorrectly suggested that these were uh, bats. Another paleontologist named Harry Seeley even wrote a book called Dragons of the Sky mm-hmm. uh, in which he said birds were the descendants of these. Uh, and it's un- it's understandable why these dudes were wrong. They were doing the best they could. <laughs> and when you look at those wings, uh, it looks, you know, that membrane, it looks like it would be a bat's wing. But there are, there are some differences. Yeah, there's some big differences. And you like a bat in particular, I could see confusing it with, right? Yeah. Like an ancient bat. Because with a bat, you have four digits, mm-hmm. and three of those digits form the bones in the wing. And you got one little digit wiggling free so a bat can climb around with its index fingers, right? Yes. 
With a pterosaur, you have three digits that are free, and then the pinky, the fourth digit, is the one that forms that long, sometimes 10, 20 feet, 20 feet long bone that's the front end of the wing. Yeah, that's crazy. But they had three, uh, they had three fingers free. And this is really significant because before they used to think, and if you go back and you look at how pterodactyls were drawn in like the middle of the 20th century, um, when they weren't in flight, they were probably standing on their back legs. And they realized that this is probably not how pterosaurs stood. That instead, because the, 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 their forearms were far more powerful than their back legs, they were probably quadrupeds, which meant that they um, walked on all four legs, using mo- putting most of their weight on their front wa- legs with their front forearms with yeah. their three free digits, and their, their wings tucked off to the side. Um, and they look kind of like, like a cartoon bulldog walks yeah. is, is what I'm seeing. That's what they think now. Like a cartoon bulldog, not a real one. Right. Well, I mean, a real bulldog doesn't walk quite like a cartoon bulldog. Cartoon bulldog's more exaggerated and pronounced. You know what I mean? Sure. It's a cartoon. Should we take another break? Sure. All right. We'll do that, and then we'll talk a little bit about uh, how they fly and, and other good stuff right after this. Pterosaurs. Well, now, when you're on the road, driving in your truck, why not learn a thing or two from Josh and Chuck? It's Stuff You Should Know. Stuff You Should Know. All right. All right. So, you mentioned they were quadrupedal. Mm-hmm. Four-footed. Four-footed. And initially, they thought that they would like birds, because we see birds do it, and it's probably especially back in the 1800s, it was uh, maybe they were all working off the notion of uh, the easiest solution is probably correct. Yeah. Because they would see a bird hop off those back legs and think, well, this is clearly what pterodactyls did. Yeah, yeah, and I never thought about that, but that's exactly what a bird does. It jumps up in the air from its back legs and flaps its wings and then provides lift from that point on using its wings. Yeah. I'd never really thought about that, but that's how <laughs> birds fly. Yeah, they hop around, and if they want to— and, and it's funny, uh, one of the other articles you sent, uh, one of those guys believed, the paleontologist believes that it even evolved into flying, that they used to hop around on four legs, and eventually they st- started jumping higher and higher and then started flapping, and then before you knew it, they were flying. Yeah, maybe they went from leaping to gliding to flying— um, and they don't know. Again, they haven't found what you would call a proto um, pterosaur, like whatever th- was the link between ancient reptiles and pterosaurs. But um, that's kind of the current guess right now is that they evolved from some small light lizard that was good at jumping. Yeah, and they're, they one of the big keys in finding out, and in, I don't think you said this, how strong their arms were. Yeah. That, that sort of was a big breakthrough because when you think of uh, – Like, you you think it all comes from the legs because they're jumping, but because they found more fossils, they realized they were quadrupedal, and they said, man, they actually have incredibly strong arms and shoulders and these little tiny feet. So not only are they quadrupedal, but a lot of that initial hopping lift may come from the arms and not Mm -hmm. the legs at all. Mm -hmm. So... They think now what they do is basically push themselves off their front arms and legs to an extent and just basically hop up into the air and then start flapping their wings rather than like a bird jumping off of their back legs. Is that what you mean? Yeah, and then uh, – but most of that comes from the from the arms and shoulders rather gotcha. than the feet. Right. And the feet, I think, just sort of drag behind uh, and perhaps maybe helped with steering. Is that right? Um, yeah, and they so there were, you can actually divide pterosaurs into two groups depending on when they they were around. One started around 150 million years ago, and then one came later. And the first groups had long tails. So if you look at old drawings of pterodactyls, you'll frequently see them with kind of like a long forked 
Devil's Tale, yeah. you know? And that is, uh, it's actually kind of accurate, they think, that the f- original ones had longer tails to learn to steer in the air, but then as they got more and more um, adapted to flying gracefully, they lost their tails. So the later ones, the ones that were around um, when the uh, Cretaceous period ended suddenly, um, mostly called Ozdar kids, which is not an easy word to pronounce. No, it's not. Um, that that they had they'd lost their tails because they had developed other methods of of changing how they fly mid flight. Right. So like they because the wing membrane was connected to their ankle from their shoulder, um, with their finger uh, kind of providing the front of the wing. <clears throat> if they altered the angle of their wrist bone or they moved their ankle in and out, it would change the actual dynamics of their wing and they could dive and lift and do all sorts of other things which is this is a big sea change in our understanding of pterosaurs too because they used to think that they basically had to run and jump off of a cliff right to gain flight or Be- hang like bats yeah because they were so weird looking and so weirdly um, developed in different ways huge heads enormous beaks big head crests small puny little withered feet you know, like, um, like, um, Mr. Burns' hands, or uh, yeah, that's a good one, or um, David Cross in the Titanica uh, segment on Mr. Show. <laughs> yeah, you're like that, right? That's like a pterosaur's legs. So it, it it didn't make any sense how they flew, but now that we're starting to learn more and more about them, we're like, oh, actually, they had a lot of really really interesting adaptations. Um, not the least of which was their bones. Yeah, I mean. Uh, are all of their bones hollow or just those wing bones? All of them. Wow. I mean, that made them incredibly light, obviously, but that also mm-hmm. ended up being one of the problems in trying to get fossils of these guys because they just they, they were very highly uh, destructible. Non-fossilizable. Non-fossilizable. <laughs> Do you remember our fossil episode? That was like one of the better old ones, if you ask me. Yeah, I agree. I learned. I learned a lot on that. Yeah, we should uh, trot that out in the selects soon. That's a great idea. That'd be a good one. Um, they also thought if they were on water, uh, like they had just had a little snack on a on a lake, that they would use those wings as paddles and just get going that way, pushing off the surface and then flapping until they were, you know, shaking it off twenty feet above the above the water. Right. Exactly. A lot like marine birds do today. Right. Mm-hmm. So those bones. Um, like you, you kind of hit it on the head. They are, ex- or they were extremely light, right? They, they were about a millimeter thick, something like the thickness of a playing card. I saw. That's but nuts. It is super nuts, especially considering that these things were holding up like a bird that was up to twenty feet tall, right? Mm-hmm. Or not a bird, a pterosaur. Yeah, not a pterodactyl. <laughs> Man, I just averted so much email, <laughs> Chuck. Uh, uh, like a millimeter thick bone wall. But the way that their bones were made, they were made of cross sections of basically like plywood. So they were really strong. And then if you cut their bone in two and looked down the hollow tube, you would see that there are little struts crisscrossing to provide even more internal support for those bones. It's amazing. So you could have a 20-foot tall uh, pterosaur that could actually fly because it was that light. I saw one um, one of the Asdar kids uh, was was something like had a 20-foot wingspan, but it probably didn't weigh any more than 20 pounds. Yeah, and some of these, I mean, what were the largest ones, like 35, 40 feet in wingspan? Yeah, so about like 10 to 15 meters in wingspan, um, like the size of like a jet plane, uh, like a fighter jet. I just flew on my first private jet. Oh, yeah. How was it? <laughs> uh, you know what? First of all, I'd, I've always wanted to fly on a private jet, but never thought I would have cause to. Uh-huh. Um, Because, you know, uh, unless you're extremely wealthy, you only do that if you get invited to for some strange reason. <laughs> right. Like you don't just book it. <laughs> you you should be on high alert if you, some wealthy person invites you on their private jet. <laughs> Uh, and it was awesome. It was as awesome as you think. And the most awesome part of it was the, uh, just the sheer lack of hassle. Yeah. Like you, like I parked my car at the little tiny airport here in DeKalb County 
uh, walked across the parking lot and into the lobby, and there's literally a guy standing there, a, a, a captain, and he was like, are you Chuck? And I said, yes. And he said, right this way. And he walked out the back door, and there's a plane, and they say, watch your head. And you get on it, and he says, you ready to go? <laughs> That's uh, was it just you? No, no, no. That was okay. like uh, five of us on an oh, eight, eight seater. Everybody was waiting for you. Uh, yeah, I was the last person to get there, <laughs> and I was a little stressed. But then I thought, wait a minute, that's the other perk is they don't leave you. Yeah, You're like there. I mean, there's a schedule, but it's yeah, not you gotta like be really late. <laughs> uh, but it was cool. I mean, there the one we were on was. Uh, I mean, it's not roomy, so it's not like Air Force One or anything. Like you feel like you can just walk around, but. Like when I was standing, I'm five foot ten, mm -hmm. and if I said completely straight, my head would brush the ceiling a little bit. Mm -hmm. But uh, and you're just like, ugh, <laughs> private jets. But no TSA. Like you just you just walk on, they fly you there, mm -hmm. and then you get off, and you're right there. It's like this, just the lack of hassle. And all I could think of was like, man, it must be great to be a billionaire. <laughs> sure. <laughs> and never have to deal with an airport again. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, it was kind of cool. But then also, once you're up there, you're kind of like, eh, well, you know, it's it's, it's not like life-changing. Yeah, you, you, me, actually, I've never flown on one. You, me, flew on one, and she said basically the exact same thing you did, that just the the lack of hassle and how fast you get somewhere yeah. um, is just, just beyond amazing. Yeah, I mean, it takes away hours and hours of airport crap. I know. You start to develop like that terrible sensation where your eyes hurt for some weird reason, even yeah. though you haven't even gotten on the plane yet. <laughs> like there's a lot of stuff that I'd be happy to leave behind. Yeah. And it also, when you're going to take off, because just because it's small, it feels like you're going as fast as you're going. Whereas in a, in a jumbo jet, it really doesn't. Right. Like I was kind of like, man, we're going fast. <laughs> so, oh, hey, so, um, Speaking of Yumi and flying, I have an update. Okay. Do you remember the story about the Russia visas that we failed to oh, get? Oh, sure. I told her that I told that story, and she was like, you said we, we forgot? And I was like, yeah, we did, right? And she's like, no. We asked like five different people five different times, and we're told we didn't need visas. So I wanted to let you know, Chuck, that we actually are as buttoned up as you think. We were just misinformed. We got that great email from a, a new listener that was like, Listen to some dumb story about some guy and his dumb visa. <laughs> I was like, "Oh, welcome to the show, brother." <laughs> yeah, you should probably. Uh, There's the exit up. door. <laughs> was that that guy? That one guy? Uh huh. Oh, okay. Yeah, he's very turned off by your aside about your visa story. Yeah, whatever. Uh, so anyway, thanks for indulging the private jet convo. Yeah, I'll bet that guy loved the private jet aside. <laughs> It'll probably never happen again. But it was basically like riding around on a on a pterosaur. So. That's how I wedged it in there. <laughs> nice work. <laughs> that is nice. So um, I'm trying to think of what else. Like, pterosaurs kind of bring out the little inner 10-year-old in me. I don't know if you've noticed, but I'm wearing my um, little uh, outdoor archaeologist boots. I see that. And white white pull-up crew socks. Mm -hmm. And I'm a, just a total little nerd. You keep dusting everything in here, too. I'm not even like one of those dinosaur nerds, but some just getting into researching dinosaurs, do, does it do that to you too? It just kind of draws out like the little kid? I think so. And I think probably because uh, at least when I was, and you and I were growing up, I feel like public schools just like did such a poor job of talking about these periods. Oh, yeah. You know? Yeah, I, I remember that. But I also remember dinosaurs being kind of huge in the 80s. Uh, yeah. At least they were in Ohio. Mm, Was that an Ohio thing? I don't know. I'm trying to remember. I mean, Jurassic Park obviously changed everything as far yeah. as. But when was that? 90s. Yeah, early 90s. Yeah, but I feel like dinosaurs were pretty popular among the kids before that. Maybe maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I hit my head and don't realize it. I don't know. I know kids. I mean, my daughter loves dinosaurs, so it's a thing. Yeah, it definitely is a thing. Um, and it's getting to be even more of a thing the more we learn about pterosaurs, too, which is Somebody called that the 21st century the golden age of pterosaur research. So they're expecting big things from the field. Yeah, and, and like you said, hopefully they can find that uh, proto pterosaur, and uh, that's when the community really gets all excited when they can make those links. Hey, you know, it's speaking of the community, I read this um, article in National Geographic, and 
God bless him, I can't remember the guy who wrote it, but it's called Why Pterosaurs Were the Weirdest Wonders on Wings. Yeah, it was a good one. It's a great article. And um, the guy basically just got into all, like, the dirty laundry of the pterosaur paleontology community. And apparently they're very well known among paleontologists for just despising each other. Like, the pterosaur paleontologists don't like each other, talk smack about each other publicly, and just snipe at one another a lot, which just makes the whole thing even that much more fascinating, you know? Huh. Like, they're real competitive and real backbitey. Interesting. Yeah. And in this case, that's a good thing. Yeah, because they keep pushing one another. Uh, agreed. You, you got anything else? <laughs> no. Are we done with pterosaurs? Uh, I don't have anything else, I don't think. Okay. Well, uh, if you want to know more about pterosaurs, go to your local natural history, history museum and say, hey, tell me about that pterodactyl. See if you can stump them. Uh, and since I said stump, it's time for listener mail. I'm going to call this one... Uh, which one is this one? Oh, um, foot binding. I, I believe we did this in a select episode. Mm-hmm. Uh, it was, it's one of our older ones, but a really good one, I think. Agreed. Uh, and this goes like this. Hey, guys, I'm a soon-to-be grad student from uh, Guangdong, China, and have been a listener uh, for a couple of years now. This is my first time writing in, and it's about foot binding. I talked to my grandmother after listening, remembering she told me that her grandmother had bound her feet. Uh, I asked if great-great-grandma had trouble walking, and she said she had never even wobbled a little bit because it turns out she never made her own little shoes. She just bought toddler shoes for herself. (laughs) Nice. Yeah. That's called uh, making lemons. uh, No, that's called making lemonade out of lemons with your feet. That's right. Uh, She said great-great-grandma came from a wealthy family, and bound feet were more of a symbol of your family wealth, uh, meaning you don't have to do farming chores and catering to the male foot fetish at that time. Uh, We are not exactly sure when she was born, but we do know that when her daughter, my great-grandmother, was born in 1914, she made sure that her feet uh, were never bound. She also put all of her kids through high school, which was very (laughs) remarkable back then. Oh, yeah. Uh, Foot binding is certainly not something that I am proud of. To think that I'm just five generations away from having to get my own feet bound, as opposed to sitting here writing you guys right now, it just says uh, to me how far we've gone. Thanks for the show. By the way... In the draft podcast, Josh was having trouble pronouncing Q I N G uh-huh. dynasty. Yeah. Uh, Q may be roughly pronounced as T S. <laughs> oh. Not exactly the same. So just say sing next time. That would do. I uh, I didn't I don't even think I tried that one. I tried every other phoneme except <laughs> for sing. Uh, and this is best regards from Ruoi. Thank you very much, Ruoi. That's pretty cool. And like nice sense of perspective too. Okay. Um if you want to get in touch with us with an awesome story like Ruo we did, you can catch up with us on social media. Just go to our website, stuffyoushouldknow.com, uh, and you will find all of our social media links there. And if you want, send us a good old-fashioned email. Wrap it up, smack it on the bottom, and send it off to stuffpodcasts at howstuffworks.com. Stuff You Should Know is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app. Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows.